Hi everyone, so my presentation today will be about identifying opportunities for smaller AI models. The content is based on my new book, which is called The Art of AI Product Development and which kind of distills um, a lot of the lessons that we learned from implementing AI in different companies, both before the launch of ChatGPT in 2022, which was a turning point in the field, but also after it. So the agenda for today. First, I would like to start with a quick reality check of what often happens when companies start out with AI. Then I would like to present a alternative approach to AI integration, which is more organic and incremental. And finally, I will show you a tool that will help you identify and also structure your AI opportunities for existing products. So let's start with the reality check. This is a very typical situation that we see in companies. So you have a meeting between stakeholders, maybe it's a board meeting, maybe it's a more informal meeting. And then one of them will say, let's use AI. So maybe the competitors are using AI and there is a lot of pressure, or maybe the person is just very excited about the technology and they think that it will solve a lot of issues in the business, or maybe just commanded from the top by leadership, by investors, and so on. Whatever the reason, often the response will be very direct and very spontaneous. Sure, let's build a chatbot, right? So that's kind of the default thinking that many people and the teams have about AI. And it's understandable, and I think it's also quite attractive. I think that most of us, including myself, we would like to build something like ChatGPT. Except that a chatbot in the context of your company, in the context of your product, it's very, very different from ChatGPT. So here is what happens. You have your product and your product already has a lot of existing data, knowledge, context, and so on. And then you go and you watch out for an LLM. So a large language model, it can be by OpenAI, it can be by Google, by Anthropic, whatever. And then you'd go and try to bring these two worlds together. When you do that, you will face two substantial challenges. The first one is about integration. So as I said, your product already has a lot of data. It has a lot of context. It has all the knowledge that you collected about your users, about their needs, about your market and so on. So here the question is, how can you load all this context into the LLM so it can actually work with it? And it's not as simple as saying, okay, now we will do some advanced context engineering, or maybe we will implement a retrieval augmented generation system. Most companies, they will even not have the databases in place to do this kind of integration, right? So the data will be incomplete, there will be blind spots, it will be disconnected from each other and so on. And so then this kind of integration is basically doomed to fail. And the second challenge is that uh, when you bring in a large language model, uh, your product normally will only use a small part of its capabilities and of its knowledge. So specifically the knowledge that is needed for <clears throat> your product operations. But then in addition to that, the LLM will also have a lot of additional capabilities and these additional capabilities that you don't actually need, they also come with new risks. So you have risk of additional hallucinations, you have a risk of bias, you have risks of toxic behavior, harmful behavior, and so on. And at the beginning, when you're just starting out and excited about your project, often you will even not see and not know about these risks, right? They will only surface later in production when users start actually using the chatbot, and then they can really have bad consequences for your product and your company. So the bottom line of this approach is that 
In these years, around 80% of AI initiatives in companies fail. So these are numbers from 2024 by the RAND Corporation, but similar reports have been published more recently by McKinsey and some other companies also. That's kind of the core statement that uh, the odds of success with AI initiatives, they are not so high. And in my experience, companies that adopt a more incremental and the more organic approach to AI integration, they can actually increase their chances of success. So let's look into this approach. And um, I think there is this uh, very inspiring quote by Andrew and G, which I would like to state also. So when implementing AI, I see more organizations fail by starting too big than starting too small. What does it mean to start small in AI? There are two ways you can go. So one, of course, is about using smaller AI models. They can be predictive AI models, or maybe you just go for a smaller language model, let's say with a couple of billion of parameters. And the other way is basically to just build smaller and more organic features into your product, right? So features that will not really disrupt the existing user experience and that will also have less risk that they expose to the user on. So let's go back to our Brownfield product. Here you basically can look for ways either to integrate AI as an internal enabler, which means that um, you will try to use it to improve the product from the inside. So for example, by improving your product analytics, so you can take better development and prioritization decisions, or you can of course also go the more glamorous and also more risky path, which is about adding user facing features into the product. Let's now talk about the AI Opportunity Tree, which is a tool that allows you to identify AI use cases in your product and then structure your whole opportunity space. So normally, when we do discovery for a new technology, we start by defining the broad benefits and strengths of this technology. And then we go into a specific product and we look at the more concrete features, use cases, and so on that can realize these benefits. So in the case of smaller AI models, we have four big categories of benefits. We have gaining deeper insights, removing friction, adding new functionality, and personalizing the user experience. So let's go through these four branches one by one, and I will try to illustrate them using examples from the travel industry. First, gaining deeper insights. Most products and most companies already have a lot of data about their users, about how users behave, how the products are used, what are the issues that occur in the products and so on. But most companies also don't leverage the full value of this data. So here you can use AI to pull out more intelligence from this data, for example, by clustering customer pain points based on support tickets and uh, product reviews by analyzing user journeys so you can identify those points of friction and of frequent drop-off and so on. And then you can use these insights to improve your own decisions about development, about prioritization and so on. Then the second benefit is removing friction. So here, I think that's a very interesting one because it's basically taking one step back and looking at the friction that is already built in, in your product. Because most products and user experiences that are out there today, they are not ideal. They are not a designer's dream and they are also not a user's dream, right? They are just the way they are because that's what the technological constraints allowed for when they were built. Now AI is there and AI can help us lift some of these constraints. So let's look at an example. This is an excerpt of uh, booking.com, 
right? And on the left, you see this long filter bar and we have it in many uh, applications that are based around search, right? So you will have this filter bar, which tries to encode all the parameters and all the categories that might be relevant to your users. These bars are painful to design and they're painful to use because there is always a lot of disagreement about which category should go in there, how they should be prioritized. And then in the end, when the filter bar is there, still some users will not find the settings that are important to them. So what Booking did here was adding an AI feature to remove this friction, right? So here you can see that they added a smart filter, which is a functionality that allows you to just input your questions in natural language, and then the AI will translate it into a structured query using the filter categories. And that's a very interesting point. So especially with small language models, you can look for all those uh, regions in your product where you have a lot of uh, structural knowledge, a lot of different categories and so on. So a lot of knowledge that the user needs to learn. And then you can see whether you can somehow optimize it by giving options in natural language, right? So switching from this categorical thinking to just using natural language is uh, a huge relief for most users. Then the third branch is about adding new functionality. And this is more of this classical PM approach where you just uh, observe the user in the context uh, of your product, right? So you look at the adjacent actions that they might be performing at the same time, but outside your product. And then you want to see, okay, maybe there are some actions that can actually be automated and implemented with AI. And finally, we have personalization. So here you can personalize the content. For example, if you are sending messages, you can adapt the style and the tone of the messages, or you can even personalize the user experience, right? So if you know that um, specific users care more about specific items, like maybe pets or uh, drinks or um, baggage and so on, then you can prioritize these in the user flow when you present the products, the offerings and so on. And this opportunity tree already provides you a hint for a prioritization because normally you will want to start on the left with the easier and less risky use cases. And then as you gain momentum and you gain experience, you can move to the right towards the more complex and more risky use cases. So personally, I'm really a fan of this bottom up approach because I think it's also something that gives you a basis for more complex applications in the future. Now we have a lot of talk about AI agents and uh, agentic AI, but actually many companies, they don't really know what their agents should be doing and then also how they should be doing it. And once you have a bunch of successful AI features in place, you not only have functionality that you can use as components to larger workflows, agents, and so on, but it also says a lot about your databases, right? So it says that your data is clean, it's clear, and it's ready for the AI to work with. And once you have that, then you normally have a much easier time building more complex stuff on top of it. So key takeaways, start small and look for gradual improvement instead of disruption. When you use smaller AI models, you can iterate and experiment at a faster pace and at a lower cost and risk. So most of these models, they're actually free to use. And in the user experience, be cautious about introducing uncertainty to your users. So expose AI gradually and at the beginning, try to do as much as you can inside of your product without exposing it to users. Thank you very much.